All right. Okay, so that brings us to the tutorial part. First, let me see. This is readable, right? Or should I increase the font size? It's all good. Okay. Make it by one. Um, all right. So uh, HPC tutorial for again around about one hour, uh, as I announced earlier. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a little bit, uh, you know, how to get started and so on. But first, what's the plan for this tutorial? So I, I've been asked to, you know, uh, do something ideally on a cluster. So I try to organize cluster access, which I can tell you is not that easy. And pretty clear, people are coming from all around the globe. And uh, if you are, I have to fight with German bureaucracy sometimes. Anyways, uh, so at least most of you uh, will have access. So we will run Julia on a cluster, maybe for the first time. Who, uh, maybe a short uh, a survey, at least here locally. Uh, who has run Julia on a cluster before? I see. Okay. So, okay. So there, there was a second wave raising the hand late. So I don't know. Was it a small cluster or? But anyway, <laughs> I see small corner of a big cluster. Uh, okay. Anyways, um, so that's good. I also good. think it's... that it depends on like submitting jobs to Slurm, SGE, PBS, whatever, or using really MPI or something like. Yes. Yeah. Sure. But uh, I mean, I just asked about the cluster, which uh, you know, a lot of people have have not done. So, uh, yeah. Of course. I know, I'll, I'll tell you in, in just one minute. Um, right, um, so uh, once again, the purpose is to run Julia on a cluster, and then uh, I talked to Oliver, what could I do in this tutorial? And uh, at JuliaCon at MIT this summer, I talked about thread pinning and you know a package. Uh, and, and yeah, we, I think we chatted for quite a while while we were, uh, were eating ice, if I remember correctly. And I tried to explain you on the fly how to use it and what's it good for and whatever. <laughs> And uh, so, so basically, we, we said, OK, let's do something about this here. So that will uh, happen. So we'll learn about thread pinning, NUMA domains, and how to control uh, everything from within Julia, and essentially study the node level performance of a little kernel, which will be XPy, which we've seen already. And if time permits, we can do a little scaling analysis, maybe move things to the GPU. We'll see. So now comes the, the part. How can you even use Julia on a cluster, right? Uh, Obviously, there's the terminal approach, right? You know, we live in a terminal. I don't care about Jupyter or VS Code or anything. Just open the terminal, SSH onto it, and then be happy with Wim and the REPL. You know, that that's like the, let's call it the old school traditional approach, which is fine and has its merits. Um, however, we sometimes want more, right? We want our editor, we want some features. Um, the good thing about VS Code is you can get it easily on the cluster these days with the remote SSH extension. Um, Essentially, what you need is SSH access to whatever machine you want to work on, ideally passwordless SSH access. Um, for a lock-in node on an HPC cluster, this is typically trivial. I say typically because there are weird clusters out there that don't have internet access and, and whatever, but typically that's easy. Getting to a compute node can be a bit more tricky, right? Why? Because there's a scheduler in the way. Right. Typically, you go to a lock-in node, say, I want these resources, allocate the resources, then you get allocated a node or multiple, and then, uh, then you have to somehow connect to those. Right? It's doable, but it's tricky, and I certainly don't want you to do it right now. I mean, for the Bolt and Curious, I have in the repository also even described how to do it, so <laughs> uh, go for it. But here, I need something simpler because we only have one hour, and I don't want to make half an hour about connecting to the cluster. Uh, so by the way, to prove you that it works, so here I am on one of our clusters. That's a compute node, Noctua 2, large, a large memory compute node, and then a number. And this entire session runs on the compute node. It's not just the terminal in the bottom, right? And so you have the integrated REPL working. At least it was working before lunch. So let's see if, if it still works. Um, maybe my connection uh, crashed. I haven't tried this again. Ah, there you go. So there's the host name. You see, I'm actually on the compute node. I can run my stuff. And if I would plot something, I get this plot window as you would get locally, right? Uh, the integrated one. Um, so that's the difference between having the entirety of VS Code running on the compute node versus just using the terminal in the bottom to connect to the locker node doing some things. Then the integrated REPL wouldn't run on the compute node, but on the locker node. Okay, I just want to show that. Okay, let let's. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to that. Promise you, you'll get the plot as you will get locally. Anyhow, having said that, I want to mention this because that's typically a bottle, uh, or at least the first issue that people have when they go to a cluster. They get a compute node and they say, "How do I get my VS Code and my 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 ex interactive experience?" There we go, uh, on the cluster. 
Um, but once again, for now, uh, for this workshop, time is short, so we will use our Jupyter Hub. Uh, so ideally, uh, this will all work nicely. I'll, I'll try it. So let's hope that uh, Murphy is uh, still sleeping today. So uh, the way you do it is you go to the Jupyter Hub. So that's uh, pc2.de slash go slash Jupyter Hub. I can also zoom in and make it big for a second. So you go to, go there. If you have the repository open that I showed earlier, there's also a link in there. And once you go there, you should see a login prompt, which should ideally, I'll, I'll leave this up for a second. Ideally, it should look like this, right? I see some nods, that's good. And there you put in the credentials that I've sent you uh, in the email yesterday. Uh, you have to, I think you have to click both of these boxes as well. So I'll show the link again and say the, uh, do the rest in talking. So once you're in there, uh, there's a big start my server button. You press it. <laughs> uh, you can, uh, it's not starting anything uh, soon, but uh, so you press it. And the good thing is there's a naturally de a natural delay in, in human, you know, abilities and <laughs> Uh, what's that? You can't connect? No. It's, okay. I hope that's only your issue. Anyway, once you once you clicked on the Start My Server button, there should be a drop-down menu. And in this drop-down menu, uh, the first one should be Julia Hap HPC Tutorial Full CPU Node or something like that. If that's there, perfect. And then you uh, pre press actually start or whatever it is called, which should be the bottom below it. Um, and this now actually, what does this do? Once you click on start, what this will do is make a slurm allocation. So basically you tell the scheduler, I want uh, to go on a compute node. I want the uh, entire compute node. So each of you is getting one entire compute node, like a regular CPU node in our cluster. And uh, by the way, I should be able to see this. There we go. I see a bunch of people uh, already running. Um, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, if you see an error, I mean, that's always what you do, right? Retry, refresh. Okay, um, and what happens is you, it allocates this, uh, this compute node for you, like uh, uh, one for each of you, and then it connects the Jupyter instance to it. And it should take only like, I don't know, half a minute max. Like, I hope that most of you already see Jupyter in front of, uh... does anyone see Jupyter? Not yet, okay. Yeah, so but I see the allocations are going through. So the R here tells me that those are actually running jobs. So the issue is only the connection. If, if you don't see Jupyter yet, just wait a little bit. Uh, if it doesn't work after you know two minutes or whatever, uh, maybe refresh or, or something. But typically just wait, it should work. All right, and um, right, once you are in Jupyter, uh, let me go here. Once you are in Jupyter, you see an interface like that. And on the left, um, there should be one folder only, if I'm not mistaken, which should be exactly the name of your username, you, like user training, uh, USTR, uh, then the number. You go in there. In there is also just one uh, folder, which is the Julia Hub tutorial, right? So for you, it, it, it starts like this, I think, just that it doesn't say Bauer C here, but you know your, your credentials. So you go in there, you go into the Julia Hub, and there you go. Here are all the notebooks and everything. So we are uh, good to go. The first thing is one XPy CPU. Uh, so double, uh, you, uh, just double click on this and then you should have the notebook open. However, there's one more thing. Um, you, you might uh, know that on clusters, uh, we use modules like LMOD modules to make software available or not, right? So if you go to a cluster, even at PC Square where we love Julia, if you go there and write Julia, it will say command not found, right? Uh, as for pretty much every other software out there. Uh, so you have to do this module load, you know, these shenanigans. Uh, by the way, I didn't say this for the VS Code setup. You have the same issue there, that even if you get VS Code to the compute node, how does the, rep, uh, the Julia extension know where Julia is, right? So basically you have to write a little wrapper script that first loads the module and then uh, sort of acts like a, a Julia script. However, here in Jupyter, uh, I've, I've compiled a kernel for you. Um, so you only have to do this once. On the left, there's this hexagon, this blue hexagon. So you click on that. Then you go to filter available modules. You type Jupyter in there. And then you scroll down and you should find, for me, it's already loaded, but there should be this thing here, Jupyter kernel Julia, and then 1.9.3, and then a bunch of other stuff. 
you don't see the hexagon. What is wrong? <laughs> I don't know. I, you should see the hexagon. <laughs> I, I mean, this would be weird. Anyways, uh, assuming you see it, Jupiter, and this is the kernel you want, Jupiter kernel minus Julia 1.9.3. And then if you hover over it, there should be a load button to the right. For me, it's unload because I already loaded it. You don't. Uh, we don't care how many threads, just because I compiled different kernels for you that you can select, just use one, doesn't matter. You get, you get more, I promise. <laughs> Uh, so you you actually don't see it? That's crazy. Maybe maybe just reload yeah. or something. Uh, okay, weird. We talked about this, right? Like over lunch. You know, there's always this one person who has some issue you've never seen before, right? I'm I'm sorry, Thomas, that it's you this time. But uh... <laughs> okay, anyways. So once you've loaded this, once again, if you see this pop up with the number of threads, I don't care what you put in there. Let, leave it at one. Just, you know, press set uh, the number. It doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Uh, typically, that's the way, you know, we know that Julia, you can only, uh, we, you can't uh, dynamically change the number of threads in a session, right? So you basically have the kernel already, how many threads you want. However, for this tutorial, I already compiled a bunch of kernels with different uh, thread variants. So irrespective of what you put in this, uh, this little pop up, if you move back to the actual notebook, the XPy uh, CPU, uh, in the top right, there's this uh, might say kernel for you, whatever. And if you click on there, from the drop down, there should be multiple Julia kernels with different number of threads. So you can just select, and I want you to select the one with eight threads for now. Okay. And once you have that, select, and then uh, you can test that everything is working by creating a new cell or whatever, or scrolling down and going into one that exists. And I don't know, compute three plus three, uh, maybe do get host name to actually see that you are on a compute node. For you, it should be something like N2, CN, and then a number, I guess. Like I'm on a GPU node. I also have a bunch of A100s. You should be on regular CPU nodes. Who has that working? Like uh, just to get a, from, from, from those that have login credentials, yeah? I see, okay. Uh, even even for you, it's working now. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Jupyter kernel 1.9.3. So the crucial point is there are also Julia modules there, but you don't want those. You want the Jupyter uh, kernel uh, version uh, because the other one is just plain Julia without the, you know, the kernels. All right. Once we've, so now we have the, uh, gotten that out of the way. We are actually good to start. So where are we now? We are on our cluster. Each of one, ha each of you, each one of you, has an entire CPU node of the cluster, which has 128 cores, and uh, we can get started with some actual computation now. All right. First thing, what are we? The computational kernel we are going to consider is XPy. We've already seen this before in my slide uh, on my slides where I showed. Uh, a Mose's uh, benchmark on Fugaku. He also used XPy. What is XPy? It's it's short for A times X plus Y. It's where A is a scalar and X and Y are vectors. And it's a very standard operation. There's even a built-in function in, in BLAS for that and KuBLAS and, and whatnot. Uh, very standard. And depending on whether you run this computation with single precision, so float 32 or double precision, we call it SaxPy or DaxPy. But in Julia, we are generic, right? So we just call the function xpy, and from the data type, it will either be uh, sexpy or daxpy. All right, and to keep us motivated, I, I promise there are only like five lines of code I want you to write, but I, I thought it's more interesting to have you at least write something. Uh, so here we want to implement this, and I'm sure you all can do this by now. So you just want to write a for loop. Uh, so you say uh, for i in, let's say, each index xy, but you can also write it in a different way. So I just want to iterate over the indices of X and Y. Again, these are our vectors. And then I want to say, and I'll use that inbounds, at, at least I think I want to use it. Uh, and by the way, if you are too lazy to type, there's also folder final where everything is typed already. So for, for those of you who are like uh, not willing to type 10 lines of code with me, uh, you can go there. Uh, right, and so X and I, was y at i, you know, most naive implementation ever, just it inbounds to, yeah, I don't know, for good measure. So, all right, now we have our serial xpy variant. And now let me say a little bit about why xpy, apart from the fact that it's just a very standard a computational kernel for benchmarking. 
what can limit performance of computations, right? Mo uh, there are generally two, two different uh, uh, things that can limit the speed. First is memory access. Uh, if that's the case, we call the application or the kernel memory bound, um, or on the other hand, floating point operation. So how fast can I do number crunching, right? That would be compute bound. And the thing is that most performance scientific codes, obviously not all of them, but most, I would even say the vast majority, are in one or another way memory bound these days. And this is not just because, you know, I mean, partially that's because how the algorithms uh, are, but also like how hardware is, like how hardware has been, um, you know, designed. So for example, here I do some, you know, back of the envelope com computations, if you will. First for uh, one CPU, as we have it in the CPU nodes, um, you know, in Noctua 2, and in the bottom for an uh, NVIDIA A100. And what I do is, I take the peak compute performance, just you know, literally from the data sheet of the vendor, and I divide it by the peak memory bandwidth, you know, just to get an estimate of the ratio of the two. And um, and what you will find is that for the CPU I get a factor of 140, and for the GPU I get a factor of 52. So what that tells you is that even in the hardware itself, there's a strong bias towards floating point operations. So that means that you know. If if we read numbers, if we operate on numbers and not uh, are not just entirely on the CPU itself, uh, that we uh, floating point operations are essentially free, right? They are essentially free. The the bottom of the neck will very likely just be getting numbers and and writing them back to wherever they came from. So there is this hardware trend, and by the way, it might change in the future. We've seen in the ARM, you know, Mac devices, they bumped up the the memory bandwidth these days, and you know, data computing is getting not just in HAP but also in machine learning and AI, right? So there might be a, a vendor shift at some point, uh, but that's the hardware we have these days. All right. So having this in mind, this idea of memory boundness and compute boundness, how many bytes are transferred per iteration in XPy? Can someone tell me? We just look at one iteration, how much how many bytes are transferred, most naively. So how many reads, how many writes do I have? And and uh, you know, what do I transfer? And let's assume float 64, I, uh, you know, for, for now. I have two reads and one write, right? So two reads, so three in total. Each of them is uh, eight bytes, right? So in total it's 24 bytes. Oh, three times, sorry. Three times eight, yeah. Yes. Well, so first of all, this is an in-place operation, right? I'm overriding Y, so there's a side effect. So the compiler cannot elide everything. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. If not, like if there wouldn't be a side effect, technically, maybe this function wouldn't do anything, right? But I will benchmark it, and I'll tell you the the number will be larger than zero. <laughs> Um, all right, anyways, um, so, okay, so 24 bytes are transferred, and how many flops do we have in one iteration? I mean, that's trivial, right? Just look at it, and they're just two, right? Like the multiply here and the plus here, right? So, okay, yeah, okay, maybe you have an FMA, but uh, we don't care. So the, and even if we have an FMA, it's still two flops. So what we are doing here is not operations, right? I, I didn't ask you like how many. So what I'm saying is that this, these are two flops. I don't care how you do them. They are two flops, right? If you do them in one, in one instruction or in two, I don't care. Eventually, you have to do two flops, OK? <laughs> if you look at vendor, vendor benchmarking. No, OK, yeah. I mean, vendor, they do what they want. But anyways. So what I'm trying to get at, again, in the vein of this, uh, this back of the envelope analysis up here is that we are transferring 24 bytes, but only doing two flops, right? So uh, so XPy is, is not by coincidence a memory bound kernel, right? It's, uh, I, I chose it for that reason. Uh, and by the way, it's so much memory bound that we actually use it, and by we, I mean also HPC folks everywhere, to measure the memory bandwidth of a system. Right, like to actually measure how fast can I transfer memory? Like it's just a fancy, more, a more fancy variant of a copy kernel, if you want. Right, that's how irrelevant the flops are in uh, in, in such a kernel. And uh, in fact, we'll do it today, and I will show you. Like we will benchmark the memory bandwidth of an entire Noctua two node, and I will show you that it's it's tricky. It's much more tricky than you might think, unless you know already a lot about uh, HPC nodes. Uh, it's not nearly as trivial and as one might think. All right, but first let's let's benchmark, you know, this uh, 
uh, the serial implementation. And irrespective of what you get there, the problem is that it will just be a number, right? Whatever number. I have no idea if this is fast or slow. I don't know what to compare it to, right? Like even if that says five seconds, maybe five seconds is fast. Maybe it's horribly slow. How would I know, right? And the right measure, in particular, uh, since we know now that this is memory bound, is not the time, right? The time it took to run, because I have no idea how fast it is supposed to run. So instead, uh, we want to look at the memory bandwidth and also at the compute performance, just because it's you know trivial to do it as well. So what I do here is I'll just generate a function generate input data, which you know creates some input data, and then measure perf, which just you know again calls this input data generation, then benchmarks everything with uh, benchmark tools. And then we want to compute, based off this time, we want to compute the bytes, the flops, the rate, and so on. So the bytes we already said, right? We have three times, so that's again uh, to do for you as well, otherwise your code won't run, you have to type this. Uh, so we transfer three times the size of D type, because I parameterize here, you know, which data type we want to use in our XPy. Um, and then times here, I don't want it per, per iteration, but for all iterations. So times capital N, which is just the number, you know, basically my area size. It's just how often I do this. The flops we also had, it's just two times N, right? It's two flops per iteration, N iterations, so two times N. And now we want the rates. So the rate uh, is basically, I just take for the memory uh, bandwidth, I just say bytes uh, over T essentially, right? Just bytes per time. But then I want to multiply by one AE minus nine because I want it in gigabyte per second, right? In the in the right scale. But that's just a scaling factor. So bytes times one E minus nine divided by T. And for flops, we do the same thing. The flops times one E minus nine divided by T. So now we have instead of just the time, right? We have a, a, a gigaflop per second and a gigabyte per second. And that we can compare to vendor numbers, for example, right? We can look up in the spec sheet, what's the memory bandwidth of this machine supposed to be or uh, of one core or whatever. All right, and I'll tell you, by the way, that idea, the theoretical value, like the AMD value, I think, is um, of like an entire node of Noctua 2 for the memory bandwidth is around about 380, 400 something uh, gigabyte per second. Um, we'll not get there entirely because there are some tricks you have to do for the last 10%, but uh, we, we'll get close. But for now, we are far away from that. And obviously, that's not a surprise because currently we're just running serial, right? We are just using just one core. And it's kind of surprising already, maybe, that this is already 20%, right? There are 128 cores in there. With one, I can get already 20% of the memory bandwidth. So maybe that makes me happy, you know, for a serial implementation. I say, well, 20%. Um, all right, so let's parallelize this thing now. First of all, it is already parallel at the instruction level, right? So uh, this is a side comment essentially. So if you scroll down, uh, you will see these, you know, parallel uh, data. So the PD is uh, the P is the critical part that indicates the parallel thing, and you also see the usage of the Y registers, which are the wider uh, SIMD registers. But that's just a side comment that without doing anything here, right? It is already parallel on a core level, on an instruction level. But we want to explicitly parallelize it uh, with uh, multi-threading. So let's do this. And you know, how do we do it? At threads, right? Julia provides the at thread macro. So let's do it. And once again, I recommend that you use eight threads. Uh, you can check it with this little cell here. So you get eight. And now let's implement, once again, the parallel version of the kernel. It's the same that we had above, just with an at threads in front of it. For i in each index. Uh, you know, why X doesn't really matter and uh, at inbounds and then, uh, you know, Y at I equals A times X at I plus Y at I. Okay. All right. So there we go. How difficult can it be? Okay. <laughs> so uh, at threads in front of it and then we benchmark it and you can already see by my, my little smileys here uh, that we don't expect uh, any or or if if at all like a tiny speed up, right? So it's slightly bit faster. So I think I had a thirty seven gigabyte or something here or thirty eight. Okay, and now I have forty one. But uh, this is more than disappointing, right? Uh, given that we have eight threads, right? Uh, we are far away from anything uh, than a parallel speed up. So how do we improve this? And the first thing I want to mention is pinning Julia threads. 
pinning is super important. And I tell you, it's like one of the, in any language, not just in Julia, one of the major reasons or, you know, beginner mistakes that people do when they go to a cluster, they don't pin the threads. Uh, and, uh, you know, 90, uh, I don't want to put a number on it, but a lot of uh, uh, issues just fall back to people not pinning their threads properly and uh, optimizing the thread pinning for the application. So why do you want to pin threads first? And what does it mean? It just means, you know, fixing the, the thread, uh, the Julia thread, pinning it to one core and one CPU thread and having it stay there and not move around or do anything. Uh, why do you do it? First of all, stable performance. If you have always the same setup, right, chances are that, you know, the fluctuation in benchmarks and so on are reduced. If threads can migrate around, you know, you have some over, uh, some some extra fluctuation from this. Double occupancy. If you start Julia native, uh, uh, and, and I'll show you in a second how you can see where your threads are. If you start Julia and check it, chances are that some of your threads are actually running on the same core, which obviously is bad because they they might interfere, right? And also fixed memory locality, which will be the purpose sort of uh, of um, this um, this tutorial. Um, but also liquid. I mentioned earlier liquid, this tool that can you can utilize to on a hardware level figure out you know what the CPU is doing. Well, you have to look at the right core. And if your thread is uh, possibly migrating around, right? What are you measuring, right? If you look at core number one and asking what are you doing, but your computation is move, uh, hopping around between cores, that doesn't make any sense. So uh, for Liquid, you know, we need thread pinning. And by the way, I created thread pinning or at least evolved it to this day also because of Liquid, right? <laughs> because I needed it. Um, all right. So what about external tools? There are other ways to pin uh, threads, like in other programming languages, Numa CTL, Taskset, and so on. They kind of work in Julia if you know what you're doing, but um, sometimes they don't, and often they don't give you what you want or expect. And that one of the reasons is that they can't distinguish between your Julia user threads and, for example, the blast threads and the libuv signal thread and all kinds of other threads that Julia uses um, right away. All right, so threadpinning.jl is uh, the only, and that is also why I can say uh, without giving me self-praise, the best, uh, way to pin Julia threads in um, uh, right in, uh, from within Julia, and you can also do it dynamically, which is cool, also in a Jupyter notebook. Um, and there are three levels to do it. First is what I call the physical level. So the function will always be pin threads. Um, if you give it a vector of or your, you know any collection of uh, numbers, uh, it will interpret this as physical CPU IDs. By physical, I mean what Linux numbers these, these CPUs, right? So that starts with zero, right? So basically you, that's the most explicit way of, of saying, I want my threads to run there. And it does it in order. So the first Julia thread will go to the first number and, and so on. The second level is the logical level. So there you say, it's, it's sort of an abstraction layer. I don't care how Linux numbers my CPU cores or CPU threads, I don't care. I wanna say, in the second socket, I want the first two cores. Or in the uh, Numa domain, we'll get to that. Uh, one, I want core four to five, right? So that's basically logical indexing. It starts with one. You don't have to know what Linux is doing. It's an abstraction layer. But most of the time, all you need is the predefined layer where you just say, pin my thread to cores or pin my thread to, I don't know, uh, sockets, right? And it's always round robin. So pinning to cores just means, okay, one thread goes to core number one, next to next core, and so on, right? Un until I'm running out of cores, and then, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll start back from the front. Same with sockets and all kinds of other options. So most of the time, just one com uh, two commands. Using thread pinning, pin threads cores, all you need, <laughs> okay? All right, um, more. Check out my JuliaCon uh, at MIT from the summer. And how does it look? Here's thread pinning. Uh, thread info is actually what I'm more proud of than the pin threads because it visualizes the cluster, which is very cool. You know, your new system, you want to see what's going on. Uh, so if you do it, you will find the, you know, it looks, uh, the colors are different in the, in the REPL. Here it's kind of yellow or orange. Um, these numbers are your Julia threads, like where they're currently running. And with a little bit of luck, if you run this again, maybe someone, uh, one has switched, right? Because we haven't pinned them yet. Um, these vertical lines are, uh, indicate sockets. So this thing is one socket and this is another socket. So most HPC clusters, including Noctua 2, are dual socket systems, right? So you have two CPUs in there. This is CPU number one, this is CPU number two. And what you can't see here is hyperthreading is disabled on, on Noctua 2. If it weren't, there would be grayish numbers, like a little different color, um, which indicate the 
sort of second threads in each of the CPU cores, but it's disabled here, so it's not there. So let's pin the threads to cores. You can check it out. There you go. You know, it does the thing that I just explained. You can pin to sockets. Once again, it's round robin, so it just you know uh, fills up the first. Uh, it goes from first thread goes to the first socket, uh, next goes to the second socket, and so on. All right, let's benchmark. And now I talked so much about pinning threads and you know how amazing it is, and you have to do it, and we get the same performance hopefully. Uh, so pretty, pretty uh, disappointing and pretty, you know, why, why did I talk about thread pinning? Thread pinning, unfortunately, in this particular case, is only half of the story. And the thing is, half doesn't here mean 50% speed up. Half means you don't get anything until you find the second part. Okay, so it's the bad version of half of the story. All right, so let's talk about numer domains and data placement. Uh, and that's super crucial. Once again, this, uh, and by the way, as a little, maybe as a spoiler what, before I do this, Parallel stencil.jl that Ludovic talked about, you know, for running these stencil computations and stencil computations are memory bound because they are basically just grabbing stuff from memory and writing to it. Uh, and parallel stencil had this issue that I'm showing you today on CPUs. Like they didn't pin threads and they didn't uh, do what I'm about to tell you. And just by making this change, I could easily for some of the codes get a, like a factor of three speed up with, with two lines of code, <laughs> a factor of three speed up. Uh, so that as a promise, uh, and here the, the speed up will, will be much, much bigger, will be a factor of eight roundabout. All right, so what's going on and what do I have to tell you? So if you look at a core, and I think I have to make this a little bit smaller here. So this is one core. So this is uh, one of the CPUs, uh, sorry, not one core, one CPU, one of the CPUs inside of Noctua 2. So that's from the AMD spec sheet. And what you see here is, so these little, you know, Zen 3 things, these are the cores. There's a shared L3 cache, you know, you have multiple of these compute dice, right? But anyways, the critical point I want to get at is, you see this dim here. Here are dim blocks, there are dim blocks, and, and so on. So basically what this means is, there's multiple RAM uh, slots, you know, in, in, in such a system. So, you know, in contrast to your desktop or your laptop, which has just one, you know, uh, RAM, uh, this CPU has multiple uh, uh, RAM instances, if you will. So multiple, what we call it, memory domains or NUMA domains. So NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access and basically uh, is the idea of accessing memory that is far away from my core, right? So let's assume my code is running here, you know, my Julia thread, I know how to pin it now, uh, thanks to the last five minutes. So I pin it to this core, but unfortunately my memory lies over here, right? In the, in the bottom left then I'm far away. The good thing is I can access this memory. Before Noma, you might not even have been able to access it. But, but this now is you can access it, but it's slower, right? And just as a rough, and, and by the way, you can also see this in you know, uh, LS Topo output, which you can also get in, a, in some version from um, Julia. There's an HW lock package. You can also get this from thread info in some sense. So thread info, if you give it as extra keyword argument group by Numa, uh, these vertical lines, which used to mean sockets, now mean NUMA domains, because you told me that you want to group by NUMA. So I immediately see that there are eight NUMA domains here. So there are eight memory domains. Why eight? Well, we have four per CPU, like these square blocks, right? Top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And we have two CPUs in, in the dual socket system. So in total, there are eight. Um, and we see this here, again, by these vertical lines. How can I now control my data placement? So what I want is I know how to pin threads, but how do I pin the memory? How do I say this memory should you know, be close to my thread, ideally? And one explicit way to do it, which I only want to briefly uh, show, is numa.jl, uh, which basically is just a wrapper around libnuma, like a, a slim uh, C library, uh, but it also provides an array constructor you know, as a sort of high-level interface of Julia. So let's do this. Uh, you load numa. And now let's create a vector. That's the regular vector constructor. The only thing is here at the first argument where you might have seen undef, uh, you know, like un uh, uh, uninitialized in, in, in some cases. Uh, here you put numa node and then a number. So basically, again, this numa node function and this entire constructor is exported by numa.jl. So you allocate it, numa node, whatever, here in that case, the first, then you fill it with some random stuff. And then NUMA also provides a function which NUMA node where you can put some data and it tells you where the data, uh, you know, where the pages are mapped into. So if I do this, 
I get a one expectedly. And if I do the same with numa node uh, number eight, right, I get eight. So now this is the very explicit way to say, okay, I want this to live in uh, this first vector to live in one and the other one in the uh, eighth uh, memory domain. Yes. Yes, which numa node? The function. Well, I mean, I, I okay, I allocated the function and provided it, but the function doesn't know that. Like right. you can put in whatever you want. So, so that works for this everything. Is the standard vector, right? That yes, works no it's matter the standard the vector. Memory. There's the the, the 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 here type of data is just uh, oh, okay. Okay, sorry, I thought there was something special. Okay, no, there's great. nothing special apart from the initialization procedure. There's nothing special about this type. So numa.jl doesn't do anything fancy here except for initializing in the right way. The only requirement is. And I'll get to this in a second a bit more. You have to have written to the memory before. So if you would uh, uh, create a vector with undef, then which numa will throw an error or a warning or I don't know how I implemented it. We again, I'll explain this more in a second. But yes, there's nothing special about the data or whatever. You can put in whatever uh, data you have, um, and you can even say data at the position three or something because a vector, you know. Uh, memory gets allocated in pages. So you can even ask like the fifth element, where does it live? And the first element, where does it? So that's, that's there for you. And I actually implemented two flavors of it. So there's actually a type argument, like two methods to figure out where it's lived because it's not so trivial. Anyways, there is the high level function. And let's do a quick and dirty benchmark to measure how much this matters. Again, this is quick and dirty. Uh, so what I do here is I put one in the uh, NUMA nodes that is close to the thread that is running this, you know, Jupyter kernel, um, like the main thread, if you want, the first Julia thread. And the other one I put in the distant NUMA node that is to say in one in the other CPU that belongs to the, the second CPU, just to, you know, uh, get a quick feeling for, uh, to, to get some different numbers, <laughs> essentially. Uh, so there you go. So here you see, you know, from 700 milliseconds to one second, just because the placement is different, right? And this might not seem bad, right? Well, come on, 700 milliseconds, where is one? But remember, we are coming from our XPy, where we, despite the fact that we use eight threads, uh, get the same performance than one. So again, the, the factor can be much more pronounced in multi-threaded cases. So let's do this. Uh, and and but before we do this, the manual way, while nice, right? You have these manual tools. You don't want to do it the manual way, right? Like I don't want to load NUMA and then specify the placement unless I, you know, I'm heavily performance optimizing whatever, uh, uh, you know, kernel is important to me or my code. Um, there's an implicit way to do it and you've all been using it without knowing it. And unfortunately you're using it uh, like if you've run Julia on the cluster uh, in, the, in the wrong way in a way. Um, and that is what is called first touch policy. So basically, if you allocate memory, the first time you write to it, that's what's considered a touch, determines where the memory page will land. So basically, the thread you know, lives somewhere on some CPU. Let's go back to this picture. Let's say the thread lives here, right? If you first write to, a, or let's say create an array for simplicity, this thread belongs to this memory domain, so the data will actually land here. Okay, so it's implicit. It's implicit by who writes first uh, to to the um, to the memory page or to the data. That's what is called NUMA first touch policy. And again, I mean writing, not allocating. You know, if you just allocate with undef, right, nothing is really happening. Once you write, that's really the critical part. And let's pin the threads to NUMA domains. Once again, that's just round robin fashion between NUMA domains. So now our first thread. Uh, lives in the first NUMA domain, the second in the second, and so on. And now you might also have an idea why I made you run the script with eight threads, right? Uh, because there are eight NUMA domains. So if you are on a cluster, and by the way, the entire problem I'm showing has been pronounced by AMD CPUs uh, in contrast to Intel uh, CPUs because they only have two NUMA domains, right? Like one per, per CPU typically. Um, so this has become even more of a, yeah, a problem, let's say. And, and now here I show this NUMA first touch idea. I use tspawn add, which is exported by a thread pinning, which basically spawns a Julia task similar to add spawn, but you can provide it a thread ID and it will uh, uh, spawn the task on exactly that uh, Julia thread and also don't migrate it away. So it uh, creates a sticky task. So let's do this. And uh, 
Right. And now let's create our NUMA optimized XPy. So with this knowledge, so here we see, right, that, you know, my threads are all pinned to different NUMA domains. And so uh, I also get the data lying in different NUMA domains. All right. So now let's do it again. So let's, uh, and now the crucial part is knowing this, and that's the subtle thing, really the subtle thing. If you just use something like zeros or rand, right, these functions in Julia to create data, you are touching the data from the thread that is actually running the rand call or the zeros call, which is not parallel. It's just one thread, like the main thread, right? So you might have a pattern, initialize my data, and then do some multi-threaded for loop. But the initialization is run by one thread, like the single thread. You touch it there, you fill it with zeros uh, or with random stuff. And that means the entire data gets mapped into the first memory uh, domain. That you later run a multi-threaded kernel, right? The allocation doesn't know, right? So that's where the, the bottleneck comes from. And that we want to change. So here we have one variant which just analyzes. So that's the, the bad part, right? I just touch it with one thread. And here we want to initialize it in parallel. So what I do here is I say, you know, uh, at threads, and then I say for i in each index. So basically I do the same thing. Uh, actually, uh, okay, there is no, oh yeah, I can do each index, whatever. Doesn't matter. And then I can do at inbounds. Uh, and now I say, you know, uh, x at the position i equals rant, let's say. And uh, let's do it like that, just for simplicity, okay? So what's the difference between that and that? I both fill, uh, if I fill X and Y with random numbers in both cases, but the one is multi-threaded, the other is not. And through the multi-threaded case, you know, hopefully I will touch to different, you know, uh, write to different NUMA domains and that will give me the, uh, some speed up. Why does this give me speed up, right? First of all, the, the thread, uh, the memory is local, um, but also, you know, I use m multiple memory channels, right? Each of these RAM, uh, them uh, have their own memory channel. And, you know, I'm not just saturating one of them, but I'm using all of them. All right, so let's do it. And the good news is that un unless I made a typo or whatever, I would be surprised actually if I, we can always have a, but okay, here there's no typo, I think. Um, anyways, so what we should find here is, and by the way, this parallel keyword is uh, uh, distinguishing the two cases, you know, initializing serially, initializing in a multi-threaded fashion. And uh, just, you see here the difference. So that's basically what we had before. And this is, you know, the new result. So we see a decent speed up, right? Just, I, I want to emphasize this enough, just by changing the initialization. I haven't changed the code, like the XPy kernel, just by initializing the data in a different way. Uh, I get a factor of whatever. However, if you think a little bit about it, what's the ideal? So now that you know you have, we have eight NUMA domains, and so what's the ideal speed up that you would, would expect? So is this a good speed up? I mean, it's a decent speed up, of course, goes without saying, but, but what would we, would we expect ideally in a perfect world? Factor of eight, right? Like why, why do I only get this factor, right? I want a factor of eight. Um, yeah, let's, let's try to get there, okay? So what's the problem here? And the problem now is, on a, of a completely different nature, and that is tasks where the threads. Julia, so far we've only talked about threads and how to pin them and how to you know pin my data, if you will. The thing is, Julia uses task-based multi-threading. So when you write at threads, it creates a bunch of tasks and puts them to a dynamic scheduler, then uh, says, okay, I'll distribute the tasks to some Julia threads. And this is a black box. You don't know which task will go to which thread. You also don't know that it will stay there. It can migrate around. So basically what we've done is, if these are the Julia tasks, these are the Julia threads, and these are my cores, we fixed the right part. We, we made sure that the Julia threads are fixed and evenly distributed among our NUMA domains, but we didn't fix the left part. So we can, uh, Julia is still creating potentially many more uh, threads than uh, tasks than we have threads, and we have no idea how it's mapping those, right? That's the problem if you want, right? Like, I mean, there's a reason why it does it. The reason is composability, nestability, right? If you have a dynamic scheduler, you can multi-threaded code, can call multi-threaded code, can call multi-threaded code, right? Because it's all tasks in the end and the scheduler will take care of, uh, you know, efficiently scheduling this to resources. But for performance engineering, like we are doing it here, this can be a, a you know, a problem because if I want to explicitly tell uh, every task where to run, right, that is on which thread, I have to basically pin it. The Julia terminology is create a sticky task, 
right? Typically to avoid task migration. All right, so that's what I've written here in, in short. And once again, sometimes you just need the fixed mapping like in, in liquid. Um, all right, so what tools do we have to fix this? And the easiest one is I already showed you one. This is this T-spawn at, right? Which creates a sticky task on one a node. But sometimes you would just want to parallelize a for loop, right? Where T-spawn at, you know, isn't as handy. Uh, so there's the static scheduling option, which was the default in Julia, but changed and caused dramatic, uh, had dramatic consequences like thread ID. And, you know, now I have to tell people even more that thread ID should actually almost be abandoned from the language, right? <laughs> uh, anyways. Uh, I'm not going. I don't have time to go into more about this task-based uh, um, thing. Static is doing what we want. Why? Because it's static. Statically, just you know, splits up the iteration interval, creates exactly as many tasks as there are threads, and then pins them, like in the sense of stickiness, to the threads. So basically, it just makes sure that we get a fixed task to thread mapping that we want. There's only little overhead. Why? Because it doesn't have a scheduler, right? Like a you know a dynamic scheduler that at runtime uh, does something. And um, the, the the downside obviously it's not composable, nestable, so you can't put an add threads loop in an add threads loop if you have uh, static scheduling. Okay. Having said all that, let's go uh, ahead and you know apply the new knowledge. So the only thing I'm changing is I'm putting add static there. So here now I um, if I'm not mistaken, that's what I want here. Nothing has okay, nothing has changed here except that now I also use at static in the initialization, right? The rule of the game essentially is you want to, if possible, initialize the data in the same way that you later call it in your computational kernel, right? Like if your kernel is doing some crazy access pattern, do the same thing with your initialization, right? It's not always possible, right? For example, in a map mole, right? Uh, it's, you know, uh, different threads need different information, right? There's no clear one-to-one -one, uh, mapping, uh, but doing it in parallel, even if it's different from the computational kernel is infinitely better or a factor of whatever better uh, than doing it in serial. All right, so let's do this. So once again, uh, we we uh, see what we get, and hopefully, we should be in the ballpark of the speed up. We won't reach the the you know uh, let's say it four hundred or three hundred eighty gigabytes, and that's for other reasons because I didn't fine tune this example enough. You also have to you know. The, the vector has to have a certain length and, you know, it has to fit perfectly into, you know, I didn't fine tune this too much, but now we get to 300 at least. So what did we have? So what is this? Like, let's call this 37 times eight. You know, what do we have? 296, right? So there you go. Okay. So what I've done here is like an innocent looking kernel, right? The most simple kernel you could think of, you know, just a bunch of array accesses has entirely non-trivial behavior on when, when multi-threading it. Um, on on a cluster, um, even just one node. And now the question obviously is, does adding more threads help, right? In some sense, we might say, no, we have eight threads, eight NUMA domains, we're already there. Question is, is one thread already enough to saturate you know, the memory channels um, within one NUMA domain, right? Um, so for that, let me look at time actually. Okay, we don't have too much time. If you want, you can run the second example. Uh, I'll actually not run it. I'll just open the final version of it uh, because it takes about, I think, five minutes to run. Uh, so let me open the this one here. So that's the scaling. The scaling is uh, doing exactly what we just did, but now I want to vary the number of threads. I want to basically see a plot, you know, number of threads as the x-axis and y is our memory bandwidth. And I want to see how does that scale if I add more and more threads to it. So for this notebook, if you want to run it, 128 threads, which is the number of uh, CPU cores of an Octa 2 node. And um, once again, I'm, I'm just going over that. And the first issue you have when you try to prepare something like this, in particular in Jupyter, Julia doesn't allow you to change the number of threads easily, right? So right now, if you want to change the number of threads, you have to change the kernel. You have to click in the top right and then say, okay, I want a different kernel. And also I didn't create 128 different kernels, but just a bunch of reasonable numbers, right? <laughs> Uh, so, and then even if I did, right, you would have to make a table and write down, okay, what was the performance that I get? Ah, not cool, right? Um, 
So how do I work around this? Uh, obviously, in a in a job script, that would be easier, right? You could just make a for loop or whatever and then print out the numbers. But I want to stay in Jupyter. And the way we can do it is basically just use a subset of the, the threads that we have. And how do I do this? I basically just say, well, I write my at static loop. I go over the number of threads. So one, two number of threads, how, uh, how many I want to use. This generates me, you know, let's say N tasks, where N is smaller than my number of threads. Um, and then I do the work that that thread should do. So basically, I chunk up my problem into uh, into parts that, uh, uh, you know, fit the number of threads that I actually want to use, and then make everything do the job, right? So I demonstrate this here. So I can run something on only two of the Julia threads, on five. You know, that's a it's a very common, I would call it a workaround, the limitation that you can't change the number of threads dynamically. By the way, chunk splitters is a little package which makes this easier. So basically, it just chunks it up for you. You don't have to think about remainder and you know, like you know, load a package, do chunks, and then there you go. All right. So here, what I've done, I've just rewritten the code, but not in an essential way, just in a trivial way that you know I'm only using a subset of the threads. No other critical changes here. No magic. And um, and once again, and now I ran this, and there you get a tabular view. Let's look at the tabular view first. Uh, because you know it's very uh, we we know exactly what's going on here, right? If we compare, for example, if we look at this table with eight threads, which we just had, even if you pin your threads, which is the y-axis, right, cores, sockets, numa, different pinning schemes, it doesn't have any influence if you do the initialization wrong, right? That's point number one. Initialization matters, and the point number two is even if if you initialize your data in parallel. You want to make sure that you pin your threads correctly, right? If you pin it to NUMA domains, right, you get this factor of eight speed up that we've seen. That's the case for eight threads. And obviously, eights is the sweet spot because that's exactly the number of NUMA domains. If we scale up further, right, the pinning becomes less relevant. Uh, why? Well, because we're filling up everything anyways, right? <laughs> like the only thing that's different is the order in which we fill it up. But eventually, they will all be filled up. And if I initialize the data in the same way that I use it later, you know, there, there's no difference or not much of a difference. Um, but even at one socket, you know, sometimes you cannot use the entire node efficiently with your code, right? Not just for memory aboutness reasons, but for other reasons. And if you don't use the entire node, right, even if you use half of the node, you can get a factor of two just by pinning correctly. All right, and here's the same thing as a plot, right? So uh, even more dramatically, I guess, um, where, where you see this. All right, and now let me uh, quickly talk about, uh, actually, before we go to XGPU, let's go to heat equation first, uh, because that's more important in the context of time, I think. Now you might say, well, okay, you've showed up this X pi, but come on, you know, it's this trivial thing, and you know, how much does this matter? And I already mentioned that parallel stencil.gl had this issue, right? And what is a stencil? Here I gave an example for the heat equation, so a partial differential equation, which you, uh, you basically compute X derivatives, Y derivatives, and then update the temperature in every time step, like an iterative, you know, uh, uh, stepping for the according to the differential equation. And uh, if you look at the code, so this is just a basic heat diffusion example. You have a Gaussian in the middle that then diffuses uh, to all sides. So not particularly interesting, but more real life, I would say. You know, you could make this, uh, you know, more interesting. Um, and if you look at the code, right? You have why is this, uh, you know, memory bound? Look at this. You all only access to memory, right? Read the derivative x at the position i, j minus one, the temperature at i plus one, j, right? Like the flops are almost not visible, right? You have like a one here. Okay, you have a division, which is a bit costly, but nonetheless. So this is all memory bound. Even if you add just, you know, one, two more terms, it doesn't matter, right? So parallel stencils is almost always going to be memory bound unless you are doing something, you know, uh, interesting or, or fancy or whatever. And if you do the same code, so what I do here is I've done the same principle that we've you know talked about uh, uh, at thread static, parallel initialization, nothing new conceptually, right? Just another problem which looks a bit more complicated, and that's why I didn't start with this because I didn't want to distract you from you know the the original argument. Um, all right, and if you benchmark this, so here I've done exactly the same thing, and I've done it again for eight threads, and what you find here is right, you see. Uh, the behavior here that, uh, uh, yeah, there's some interesting part that it actually even also skates for serial. I, I haven't, when I created this last week, I wasn't sure what it is. 
I have to think about this, but it scales badly. Uh, so my point still holds. You want to initialize parallel, and then you see the expected uh, speed up. And I, I don't want to hide this from you. I also tried to run this over the entire cluster. And uh, up until 64 threads, like half of the node, the story is you know exactly what I told you. For 128, the serial part was surprisingly fast, and I have no idea why. So that's why I sort of sweep it under the rug here. I have to uh, figure this out uh, before I can uh, explain it. I mean, it was still bad compared to the parallel one, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Um, right. But this is sort of like my 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 little motivation of, you know, this comes up in partial differential equations. Now I can brand it in whatever way I want, right? I can brand this as, uh, uh, you know, a bottleneck in geophysics, uh, uh, you know, uh, codes and so on. Um, all right. And uh, last thing, I mean, I'm running out of time, but let me at least mention it. It's this uh, XPy uh, backend agnostic. Uh, we've already heard about uh, kernel abstractions. At least the, the word has been dropped a few times. And I wanted to mention it here. Also because uh, kernel abstractions didn't support the story that I just told you about. Uh, it now does. Um, so kernel abstractions is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, you know, it's a way in Julia to write backend agnostic code. So basically write a kernel, like a computational uh, function, and then you say, uh, well, run it on the CPU, run it on the GPU, and it will automatically create like a CUDA kernel for you or, or whatnot. And, uh, and, and that's what's called a backend, right? CPU, CUDA backend. And what is new now uh, is the CPU static true like with a keyboard argument, like this uh, CPU backend. And why is this important? For exactly the reason that I just mentioned. Essentially, CPU, the backend, if you run it in, a, a, will run it just with app threads. Whatever the kernel is, it will just run it with app threads without uh, with a default scheduler, which is the dynamic one. And with static true, it will run it with app threads static. Um, so we, uh, I added this, in fact, to the kernel abstractions. And I also modified the initialization functions which were doing the naive thing, right? It would, uh, what they did were, well, if the backend is CPU, use zeros, right? And if it's a, um, you know, a um, CUDA backend, use CUDA.zeros. But what it didn't do is it didn't initialize the data in parallel. And obviously, how is kernel abstraction zeros at the point of function call supposed to know how you later call it, right? It doesn't know the kernel that you later use. It doesn't matter. Even, that's what I said, even if, uh, the kernel is completely different from the parallel initialization that I do in zeros. It's still much, much better, right? Because you distribute the data evenly over the cluster. It might not be optimal, right? You have to do more work for that, but it's still much better. So what I do here is I just initialize it in parallel in the most trivial way, right? Just chunk it up equally, right? There's no not, nothing more that I can do uh, in the generic case. Um, and if you run all of this, this is the same kernel, the XPy code, just now, I, you know, a little bit more uh, jazz around this kernel abstraction stuff. Um, and now, once again, if you compare CPU without static to the one with static and correct pinning, then you get, you know, this huge speed up, which we also saw when we switched from dynamic to static, right? And, and the cool thing here, obviously, now is you can just load CUDA. So I can do this here because I have an A100 uh, GPU. Uh, you could also, uh, and can, I think, for one more hour after this uh, course, uh, if you log out out of Jupyter again, like uh, you remember this drop-down menu that you had, there was a second entry, so that you can get an A100 at least for, I don't know, some time after this tutorial, right? And then we can compare this. So here I just compare, you know, let's scroll down to the table, the broadcasting variant, um, manually written CUDA kernel, Kublas has XPy built in because it's such a standard operation, and then kernel abstractions, uh, running on the GPU. And so here you see that, you know, uh, uh, you pay a little price for broadcasting if you do the naive thing, uh, but it's still very much in the ballpark of the, the other variants, which is amazing because, you know, uh, it's the easiest, by far the easiest to uh, way to, to run code on the GPU. Uh, but even kernel abstractions with this backend agnostic thing doesn't lose to, to the others or, you know, with that, I mean, this is fluctuations, the, the difference here of the benchmark. All right. Uh, with this, I think I'm at the end of the time. Uh, and yeah, uh, obviously questions, you can either ask them now or I don't know, I, I, once again, I, I'll be around uh, for, for two more days. So uh, yeah, thank you. Any questions right now? Any questions? Yeah.
Thanks a lot. Before we move too far, I was trying to, I, I think I didn't understand where, why you got the factor of eight despite distributing uh, data uh, at different places in memory than, it's not the closest place to the NUMAS, right? The... Well, it is the close, so, so what we did, right? What we did is uh, we, we have one vector, a long vector of right. elements, and we have multiple threads that operate on chunks of this this vector, right? Just by the splitting that at threads does, right? At, in particular, joint at or not necessarily joint. So at threads, static promises you that it's contiguous and in order. So basically, it promises you the first n element, where n is you know number right. length divided by number of threads, goes to the first Julia thread. That's a promise by at threads static. Okay. Um, so we basically in order you get a mapping from your your big array. Um, in terms of these chunks to uh, Julia threads. And once you have that mapping, um, you know, then uh, we initialize the data, right, from that respective thread. So the, the thread that will process the first chunk in exactly the same way as it will be used in the kernel, it. It writes rants in there or zeros in there or whatever, right? So this is a promise from this static thing that yes. uh, they're synchronized. Yes. To, Once uh, again, that's the difficulty that. about just at threads. At threads gives you this high level, you know, composability and all that that stuff. There's nice stuff. Um, in particular, if you write a library, right? Uh, the user might write a multi-threaded loop and call your library in there, which might be multi-threaded. So composability is great and important. But for that thing, right, you need to know where your task is running, on which Julia thread the task is running, because only then can you establish something like a memory locality? If the if the thread is, I don't know, running somewhere else, right? The best thing you can do, and you still see the speed up, right? If you initialize the data in parallel and spread it out over the cluster, even with task migration and all this, uh, you know, dynamism, you still get a speed up, right? Because you distributed the data. It's better than not distributing it, but you pay a heavy price for, um, you know, in that case for the dynamism. Maybe then shortly um, you can say, what is the disadvantage of putting static all the time well i i already made the case so the disadvantage is and and to be frank you know when i do these performance engineering things i put static all the time i i'm just frank with you but the disadvantage is right is your code is not composable anymore so you basically it's the it's the old school way of doing hpc right i mean still the current way to a large extent to tell every thread what it should do right whether you use at thread statics or t spawn at or whatever i don't care you t essentially, the, the 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 philosophy is to tell every thread exactly what it should do, and that is great because one, if you understand the hardware and the, your problem, right, you can utilize all that knowledge and put it, you know, get some great performance. But the disadvantage is that you lose flexibility. By the way, just to make a case, Blast is multi-threaded, right? It's not in Julia. These are different threads. If you run multi-threaded Julia, I think uh, uh, also uh, Chris and I had a little discussion and some other folks on the Julia Slack about this. Should Julia be multi-threaded by default, right? And there are cases for uh, for both sides. I don't want to discuss this here. There's just one thing. There's always caveats and uh, whatever we choose. Because if you write a multi-threaded for loop and write a simple matmol in there, right? By default, Blast, at, at least as of now, has, I don't know, 128 threads or whatever the number is these days. Right, so you have nested multi-threading, which will just you know oversaturate everything because if Blast thinks okay, I can use 128 threads, right? But in reality, it competes with all the multi-threading. Got it. Thanks. Any, any other question? Yeah, don't don't let Valentin know you put static everywhere. He really likes the composability of the new green threads and stuff. Well, uh, actually, Valentin isn't uh, not the biggest fan. I mean, either. maybe you take this offline. <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, uh, no, so, I no, mean, I have for... uh, actual questions. So yeah, yeah, go um, ahead. Yeah. Like I, what I was saying. So I used uh, distributed computing for yeah. doing physical analysis, and uh, to be frank, our tasks are really, really naively parallel. You mm -hmm. process each data in the same way, go to yeah. histogram, you add histogram together. Yeah. Uh, the question is, the problem is right now, we don't have any user-friendly uh, kind of ecosystem. So for example, mm -hmm. in Python, they would just kind of have a Dask uh, mm -hmm. dashboard to look at these things. If things fail, Dask would reconnect, reschedule, reroute the tasks to different yeah. things. 
currently we kind of have to do everything. Uh, yeah. Is there any comments on kind of like a slightly higher level ecosystem wide uh, well, status? Yes. So there. So first of all, the closest thing to Dask is Dagger, right? The effort by Julian to to basically say, okay, I know I have threads, I have multiple machines, so distribute it. Uh, maybe even GPUs, and then you basically put a DAC in, right? Like a, a graph that that says this is my computation, schedule it, right? So th that's the attempt of Julian, but obviously he's just one person, and you know I don't know uh, where we get with that. But that's the first answer. Is there a high level interface? So by by far, multi-threading is a you know if if I'm frank, is like a is a how do you say it? like it's it's lacking behind in Julia. If you copy, like for distributed computing, I can point at least HPC folks. I can put it to MPI, right? I can tell them you can call into the C library, and then everything is great. They know it already. Um, but high level libraries, multi threading, you know, even at threads, has so many intricacies with the different schedulers and promises that it makes or doesn't make for good reasons or not. So it, it was supposed to be a high level thing at threads, uh, at least that's what Valenti told me. It's not, in my opinion. It's a foot gun in many cases. And there were attempts by Taka, for example, who, who you know, created folds and transducers. Unfortunately, you know, we all know it. He's, he's sort of gone and uh, hope the best. So we, I don't, I don't actually know anyone in HAP that use MPI to do analysis just because yeah. there's actually sure. zero interpress. Sure. So, so it, it's something way simpler than that, right? Like MPI is I, I get gun. it. I get it. I, I get so, your point. Yeah, I yeah. try to generalize. Now, in your case, I mean, essentially what the high-level interface that you currently have is PMAP, right? If you say the data, uh, you know, data parallelism, if you say you have different data, but the function is the same, right? That's kind of what PMAP uh, is, is for. Oh, right? and also 20% uh, of our nodes fail before the task finishes. Yeah, so we yeah. Need the, the task management, once again, PMAP. Like yeah. the task management, this is not a fundamental problem in Julia. Yeah. This is just work, right? And once again, the person that currently has this at least written somewhere on the to-do list is probably Julian, <laughs> but he's overloaded with AMD stuff and so on. So if you if you would give me more developers, right, this is something we can solve easier than other problems, right? Where we come into conceptual debates about what is the right way forward and so on. Like distributed, even PMAP, right, currently doesn't use the fast interconnects in, in HPC centers and so on. So yeah, they're, they're, it's a mixed state. It depends on what your task is and what you do. And uh, yeah, it's a mixed state. I, I, I wish I had a better answer. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all I want to know. Thanks.